So last time we left off, we have the Persians going and wanting revenge. We talked about how they built a, uh, a bridge at the, the Dardanelles, we call it the Hellespont, and how they are seeking to get revenge. Okay? Well, we're going to see what happens with this whole revenge plan. So right over here is where we're going to see they're um, going to cross over from Asia to Europe to attack. Because remember, the Persians, they are angry at Marathon for losing that battle that they should have easily been able to win because they had so many more soldiers. They're angry still at the Greeks because of the Ionian revolt where they had gone and helped Miletus and the Ionian Greeks rebel against the mighty Persian army. Now, we talked about this story right here with Themistocles going and getting ships. You don't have to write anything here. So we remember, this was all about a lie. Yeah, so everyone was going to get 10 drachmas a piece. That was a ton of money. I was, it, was, it was like, so everyone's saying your family's going to get $10,000. But Themistocles in, in, gets them convinced to instead buy 200 warships, 200 triremes, because they said the giant the the Aegeatans were going to attack, which of course was completely a lie, but the people of Athens believed them. So that's reviewing where we were. Now let's get on to what Thermopylae is going to wind up being. Oh, well, there's a trireme, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot I had that slide next. So this is what it looked like. And so we can see that, yeah, this was designed to go and do ramming. Um, so this is the, the battering ram of the ship. This would be made of bronze, whereas the rest of the uh, ship would be made of wood. And the whole idea is you want to go and hit um, the other ship right in the side, right there with that big battering ram, split it in two. Now we get to Thermopylae. Okay. Now, a humongous army is sent to Greece. Herodotus writes 200,000 soldiers, which would be one of the largest armies ever created in the world at this time, um, with the exception of the armies fielded in China, which were mind-bogglingly huge. A thousand ships. This is a huge invasion force, and the Greeks don't have much time to deal with it. Now, they realize that this battle, they have to work together. There's no way they can do it alone. So we are going to have Athens with their new navy defending by the water for those thousand ships. And we're going to have Sparta defending on land. But here's the big problem is there is no way the Greeks can muster up an army to battle 200,000 soldiers. So the Persians are coming, coming, coming. Excuse me, they're the red. I apologize. The Persians are going down the coast and they want to get to the city state of Athens. So as you notice, um, the brown is mountains. They pick this very narrow area, 50 feet wide to defend. Why would the Greeks choose a narrow spot to defend for this battle? Why wouldn't they pick out here? Why wouldn't they back up a little bit and go over there? So why are the Greeks picking such a narrow spot? Why do you think, Kirthana? Because then they would be able to surround all of the Greek army. They're able to surround? I'm a little confused. Can you maybe rephrase what you mean by that? So the Greeks are the blue. They're choosing to go in this little narrow spot. Persians are the red. So what? why do you think again? Sorry, sweetie. Never mind. Okay. So why are they choosing this area? Why do we think, folks, narrow down soldiers, less space to defend, Eliza says. Yeah. Because remember, if the Greeks only have a small army, they don't want to fight in a big open spot because, and I think this is what Kirzan was saying, then they couldn't get surrounded. I think that's what she meant by that. Now, how did people fight back then? Close up or far away? Close up. Close up. So you can only fight with the amount of people that are able to get up. You know, Lexi is only able to go fight with Lance if they walk up to each other. 
Don't fight with Lance, by the way. He's such a good boy. And you're such a nice girl. <laughs> so they can only walk up to each other and fight each other. Back then, they don't have guns. They don't have rockets or planes and bombs. They can only fight right up to each other. So it doesn't matter if they fight here if the Persians have 200,000 soldiers. Because look how big this block is compared to that little teeny tiny blue block, block for the Greeks. It doesn't matter because they can only fight what's in front of them. So they pick this narrow area to defend it. And so what we have is we have the Spartan king, Leonidas. He has 300 of the best Spartan warriors and 7,000 other Greeks to defend this little area. So 7,300 versus 200,000. Can you believe that? That is such a humongous number. So if we go and open up our calculator and we divide 2,000, and I can do it right in front of you. So if we divide 200,000, so 200, now make it 1,000, divided by 7,300. That means for every one Greek soldier, there were 27 Persian soldiers. Now, I know that Riley is buff and tough, but I don't think Riley, even being one of the greatest Greek warriors ever, could defeat 27 people on his own at once. So that's why they choose this narrow area so that, yeah, Riley's up there fighting and Riley's only fighting there one guy at a time. So this is going to even the odds out some ways. Now, forebodingly, <laughs> the Greeks had a prophecy before they went that for the Greeks to receive victory, a king must fall. So Leonidas hears this prophecy beforehand. So he goes into this knowing very well that the gods are saying if the Greeks are to win, he has to die. Now, the Persians attack the Spartan lines. Actually, it's really cool. Before the battle begins, um, and this is something that's kind of cool about ancient warfare, that we don't see this kind of thing happen today. The Persians sent an emissary a diplomat to go talk to them. And they talk to a um, the Spartans and they say, look, we have so many more soldiers than you. We have archers, we have everything. You have nothing. And just surrender, okay? Like put down your weapons and we won't harm you. So that's what the Greeks are told us because they're looking at an army of 200,000 soldiers against them. And the Greeks are like, nah, we don't wanna do that. And then one of the Persians says, we have so many archers that our arrows will blot out the sun. And this is like one of the coolest lines that's ever been said. Um, <laughs> one of the Spartan guys, the commanders, he goes, well, then we're going to fight in the shade. <laughs> and so the Persians say, OK, it's your funeral. And they attack. But the Greeks push the Persians back. So they attack again. The Greeks push the Persians back. So remember, these are the Greek hoplites. Look at them. They've got all of this armor on. They've got these shields. They fight like this close together. So it's practically impenetrable. Whereas the Persians, we saw it. The Persian soldiers, um, they barely had any armor. They, you know, they didn't, they didn't have armor. They had cloth. You know, the Persians, I'm going to show you a picture right here. You know. This is what the Persian soldiers, oh my gosh, it's not working properly. This is what the Persian soldiers look like, wearing clothes. Often their shields are made of wicker. So against that, yeah, so there's no chance. So the Greeks push them back, push them back. They said they had to take breaks to go clean up all of the Persian bodies because so many Persians were getting killed fighting up against these guys. But still, the Persians keep on coming. But it looks like the Greeks might win. They're getting excited. But then a traitor reveals to the Persians that they there's a little tiny path that they can send soldiers to that would go right behind the Spartans. 
Now, there were actually Greeks defending that pass, but they had rumors go around saying that the Persians were going to retreat from here and attack their city state. I think it was Thespia or something like that. And all of these Greeks, they desert their post. They run away to go defend their home for an attack that's not going to happen. So now the coast is clear. The Greeks hear about how their allies deserted them. They hear about how the Persians were about to surround them, which, yeah, guess what? They're super well defended in the front, not so well defended in the back. You know, then, you know, literally the Persians could crush them because they can come in from all sides. So the Spartans then, they go send most of the soldiers back. We say 300 Spartan soldiers and 1,000 other Greeks stay to delay the Persians as long as possible. The rest, because it was certain doom, retreat. And this is where we get the, you know, the romantic story of the last stand of the 300 Spartans where they battle to the death against the Persians. Well, everyone always forgets about how in the beginning there were 7,000 other Greeks because I guess, you know, the 7,300 Greeks doesn't sound as, as good. And everyone then forgets that last stand. Actually, there was another thousand Greeks with them, but they stay. Leonidas is killed, just like the prophecy said. But Herodotus says that 20,000 Persians died in this battle. So think about it. How that was almost three times the amount of Greeks total. So the battle, although a Greek loss, does exactly what it was meant to do. It delays the Persians. The Persians aren't able to go to Athens and, just, and get all the people. The people escape. So when the Persians get to Athens, it's empty. It's a ghost town. Here we just see, um, you know, famous, I mean, can you imagine <laughs> how scary that would be to be one of those Greeks and just see a never-ending line of Persians on the way? And that will be our notes for the day. I'm stopping the recording now. I hope you guys enjoyed hearing about the Battle of Thermopylae.